Great, thank you, Tim. So Australia imports many, um, relies on imports for many chemicals and we'd suffer enormously if those suppliers were cut off for any reason. So I'm Mark Cooksey. I've got 20 years experience in innovation in the mineral sector, uh, mostly with Rio Tinto and CSIRO. And I joined ABX two years ago. And if there's one thing I'd like to remember from this presentation, it's that ABX Group is judiciously investing in a small number of opportunities to increase the supplies of strategic minerals and chemicals. Okay. Next slide. So that's our standard disclaimer. And then our corporate overview, uh, you'll see the share price um, over the last couple of months has increased to from 10 to 14 cents and then to 18 cents, 18, 19 cents more recently. And that's really pretty clearly on the back of our rare earth announcements. Next slide. So as I said, ABX Group, um, we're creating new sources and technologies for the supply of strategic minerals and chemicals. And we've got three areas. Um, one is rare earth exploration. The second is the production of technology for the production of aluminum fluoride, a strategic chemical. And the third is bauxite exploration and mining. And I'm just gonna describe the first two of these today. Next slide. So rare earth discoveries, next slide. So you may know that rare earth elements have many applications, demands growing rapidly, especially for things like electric vehicles and wind turbines. China dominates the markets from mining right through processing and even to the applications. And the prices of different rare earths can vary enormously, even by a factor of a thousand. And that's because you mine a certain mix of rare earths in the ground and the demand is a certain mix depending on the application and those mixes don't match. So ones rare earths that are in deficit are very high priced, ones that are in surplus are much lower priced. And they're very difficult to substitute just because one's higher priced, you can't easily then substitute it with a lower price rare earth. Next slide. So most rare earths come from what are called hard rock deposits. And that's certainly all of the ones produced in Australia and even in China. And they're, they're fine, they're good, um, uh, you know, good grades. Um, but the one thing is that because the rare earths are uh, bonded in the mineral re requires quite complex and therefore expensive processing to extract the rare earths. Another type of rare earth deposit is what's called an ionic absorption clay. So this is where it's actually a clay deposit where rare earth elements and compounds have been absorbed to the clay. Um, these are currently only mined in Southern China. There's people like us looking around the world. And these deposits contain a much higher pro proportion of the higher value rare earths, particularly the ones for the permanent magnets, which is the largest market by value for rare earths and the fastest growing. And so on the left there is a graph showing that a typical, a good hard rock deposit has a high proportion of the lanthanum and cerium, which is relatively low value, whereas an onic clay on the right has a much higher proportion of the two green pies, pieces of pie, uh, the higher value, um, heavy rare earths. And also because the processing is easier, generally, there's lower processing costs and also a shorter time to get into production. Next slide. So ABX, we are looking for rare earths, particularly in Tasmania. And we are the first company to discover rare earths in Tasmania. And this is built on the back of our previous um, bauxite exploration and mining efforts. And the results, I mean, it is relatively early days, but they look very promising. So we're seeing um, good grades, they appear to be the ionic type. So the mix of rare earths that we're seeing is very similar to the previous slide showing, you know, we see a high proportion of the heavy rare earths. And also clearly the ground is clearly a clay. So the evidence is that it's an ionic clay, but we still need to confirm that. It's at fairly shallow depth and also very low levels of thorium and uranium. And, you know, it's covering a pretty wide range. So that um, is sort of up around Launceston. We've got um, results over a 50 kilometer range. So it's quite exciting. Okay, next slide. So our strategy is to 
you know, rapidly develop low cost production of a rare earth concentrate and because it appears to be the ionic clay type, you think that's, that's feasible. So we're currently doing metallurgical testing. This is with an external laboratory to determine how, what percentage of the rare earth can be recovered from, from the ore. That's a, another good way of determining whether it's this ionic clay type. We're doing further drilling campaigns. In fact, one's happening right now. The team has been there for a couple of weeks and will be there for another um, month or two to expand our results. And we're also looking at um, you know, improving our exploration capabilities to identify even further rare earth deposits. So it's quite an exciting time. Um, we want to move quickly to capture the, the opportunity in this market. Okay, next slide. So now onto the second area for ABX is quite different. It's called, it's a, a subsidiary that we own, 83% own called Alcor for the production of aluminium fluoride. Next slide. So aluminium fluoride is a chemical. It's essential for aluminium smelting. So without it, uh, your smelter within a couple of weeks would be in real trouble, almost to the risk, you know, really to the risk of shutdown. There's over a million tons produced a year. It's over a, US $1 billion market. Australia is the largest aluminium producing region in the world without its own local supply. So we rely entirely on imports and most of it comes from China. So China is basically self-sufficient. They produce a small amount of excess and we're the biggest importers of that. It's a relatively high cost material. The reason it's over US $1,000 a tonne, in fact, it's $1,800 a tonne at the moment, is that the fluorine um, you need to get that from fluorite and there's not that much high grade fluorite around and that's leading to relatively high costs. So uh, the, the opportunity is, well, is there a better source of fluorine? Now, coincidentally, the aluminium industry produces a, a, it's called an aluminium smelter bath waste, which is very high in fluorine. Now for decades, that material has been sold to new smelters that are being constructed. In the last five years or so, and it's only gonna get worse, is there's not enough new smelters being constructed. And so this material is now at risk of becoming a waste that smelters have to stockpile. So what we have is in Australia, a need for aluminum fluoride, and all the smelters are producing a fluorine heavy waste that they don't know what to do with. Next slide. So what Alcor is doing is a process to turn that aluminium smelter bath into aluminium fluoride. So we've developed processes to get the fluorine out of the bath and also to make the material even cheaper, we're looking at lower cost sources of aluminium. And uh, one of those is called dross. It's another waste from the aluminium smelting process and also bauxite, which you know, is a relatively low cost source of aluminium. So this is just a perfect illustration of the circular economy. We take the waste out of the smelter, we turn it back into a material that the smelter needs. Next slide. So looking at the economics, so this is based on long-term historical prices, exchange rates, et cetera, and our best estimated costs for a 20,000 tonne per year plant, which is our planned ultimate plant size. Um, and there's some different scenarios there, depending on what uh, raw material we use, the aluminium, um, whether I'm being uh, conservative or optimistic with prices, but really it's you know, attractive under all scenarios. And that's because the bath can be obtained at very low cost. And also not only do we produce aluminium fluoride, we produce a couple of other co-products that are industrial chemicals. And so there's some revenue from that as well. Next slide. So where we're up to is we have demonstrate the process in the laboratory. We can get the fluorine out of the bath. We can make aluminum fluoride. That's basically the same as existing aluminum fluoride. So we're now moving to the pilot plant stage. There's a couple of pictures shown there where we need to do this, say at 10 kilograms an hour to uh, demonstrate the process in order to scale it up to commercial. Next slide. And so our plan is to um, say that it's the, the second Box there is our pilot plant stage, which is being, being done at our same research facility on the New South Wales Central Coast. The next stage is a small commercial plant planned for Bell Bay in Tasmania near the existing aluminium smelter. 
that'll produce 1,300 tonnes a year of aluminium fluoride. That's just a proportion of the Australian market. But it's the right combination of a, a suitable amount of scale up, um, but also positive cash flow. Estimated capital cost of $16 million. And a week ago, the federal government announced that we'd received a $7.5 million grant to support that project. That was fantastic. And we're very grateful for that. And then the plan from that, once we prove it at that scale, is then to multiply by 15 to a larger plant, 20,000 tonnes a year of aluminium fluoride, which will supply basically the Australian market. Thereafter, you could go overseas and you would build other plants at, in major aluminium producing, around, producing regions around the world, such as Quebec or the Middle East. Next slide. So thank you for listening. And so, yeah, our two big areas, rare earth exploration in Northern Tasmania, and new technology for the production of aluminium fluoride, an essential chemical for aluminium smelting. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Mark. Um, just starting with rare earths, um, and I note that you said that you got low radioactive elements in, in, in your uh, samples there. Um, generally to find rare earths, you have to have that radioactive element to actually have tools to help find them. So how, how do you discover uh, these kind of rare earth elements without that radioactive uh, yeah, so I think the ionic clays are different. And so, um, in fact, Ian Levy, our, our previous CEO, uh, steel director and, and head geologist, um, he had the theory that there could, you know, based on his experience and knowledge and networks, that there could be some rare earths that formed in a similar manner to the bauxites. And so it was actually looking around our bauxite that led to our discoveries of the rare earths. Makes sense. And and do you expect to see some sort of government funding at some stage in, in this um, part of your business? Uh, definitely. I think we've we've seen there's been um, many grants given out to rare earth companies at different stages, and uh, I, we'll be absolutely seeking those, and I think we'd have a good chance of success. We're just not quite at that point. I think uh, later this year, once we have our, well, probably in a few months, when we have our latest drilling results uh, and some metallurgical results, that'd be the point where we'd start seeking um, government support. And the government's being very proactive about this area at the moment. And, and in regards to aluminium, do you have any support from some of the aluminium companies out there? Yeah, for sure. So we're working closely with one. So the two big companies in Australia are Rio Tinto and Alcoa. We talk to them regularly. You know, my background's originally in that industry and also with the global companies. I've got the global companies actually, you know, I know them from previous uh, roles, actually approaching me saying, Mark, we've got this problem with our smelter bath, what are we gonna do with it? We know you're working on a solution. How can we help you? So that's um, very exciting. And it actually means, yeah, no, that's very, that's very exciting. And, and are there any competitors in this space for, for alcohol? No, not really. It's quite interesting because, you know, the aluminum fluoride, you know, it's just a, a nice little industry um, the people that are currently producing it rely on a good source of fluorite. And so when they see bath, they just see that as something completely different and not something they're geared up to do. And the aluminium companies, although they want a solution, they really want someone else to come up with a solution and for them to support it. They don't want to get into it themselves. So we're actually, I've seen, you know, maybe a couple of university papers elsewhere, but we're the only people doing this uh, seriously. And, and how confident are you that you'll be able to kind of commercialise your uh, technology? Yeah, well, uh, confidence. Um, at CSIRO, I was involved in the development of a lot of similar technologies. And there's always, you know, there's always something that can hurt you. You know, the, the market's hard to beat or the raw, there's not enough supply of the raw material. This one, I think, has the highest chance of success of any I've been involved in because it's a very stable market, very predictable um, we know this raw material will be available for decades, um, you know, and we believe at low cost because it's only going to grow in it as a waste. And um, we've got a good technology and there's barely anyone else looking at it. So it's very satisfying from that point of view. And um, what, what can shareholders uh, look towards um, over the next 12 months or so, just as we finish up? So um, this year it'll be we've got on rare earth, there's more drilling results. Um, metallurgical results and on Alcor it is um, construction and operation and the performance of the pilot plant and engagements with the aluminium companies.
Mark, thanks for your time. That's all we have time for. Um, love to get you back on later in the year. Great. Thank you, Jim. Have a nice weekend. Thank you.